Hello everyone, I'm Eric Dunn. Welcome to the interview series here in the Productivity Dojo. Our guest today is David Allen, creator of the Getting Things Done work-life management approach that has already changed millions of lives. Um, he is, well, you, David, are widely recognized as a leader in everything that is related to personal and organizational productivity. Thank you for being here with us. Absolutely, my pleasure. Absolutely. Uh, before I dive into the, the questions, because I have tons of questions, I'd like to read like a few facts um, and, and then jump to the first question. So, Getting Things Done, your book, The Art of Stress-Free Productivity, which has sold more than 1.6 million copies uh, last time I checked. Forbes has recognized you once as one of the top five executive coaches in the US. Time Magazine called your book, Getting Things Done, the definitive business self-help book of the decade and so forth so now you move recently to amsterdam probably fewer people know you there uh maybe i'm wrong how do you explain the getting things done concept to your new barber you know there's the 22nd version the 22nd version is look you got anything potentially meaningful you can't finish when you think about it get it out of your head sooner than later decide what the heck you're going to do with it, if anything, in terms of any outcome you're committed to and any action step you need to take to move it forward. Park the results of that in some trusted categories that you can then reflect on and review on some regular basis so that you feel okay about what you're doing and probably more important, okay about what you're not doing. That's it. So I'll confront you with something about GTD. GTD has a lot of geek appeal, right? Um, how did a pitch it to people who normally wouldn't give a damn? Well, I, I, I don't have a lot of an agenda of doing that. There are enough people out there in enough pain. My job is finding them that I can help. So, you know, if, if, you know the funny thing about this, Eric, is that the people most attracted to this are the people who need it the least. It's the most productive people that are creating their own craziness, creating their own out of, the, out of controlness by the very nature of the fact that they're so productive and creative and innovative in terms of what they do. And for them, a, a, a whole lot of what my stuff does is it relieves drag, it relieves pressure on the system. But you actually, you don't have pressure on your system if you're not going anywhere. So if somebody who's just in their comfort zone probably doesn't have any particular reason to change necessarily what they're doing. I think the truth is, you know, most people are living in a lot more stress and pressure than they realize. So, you know, I have the marketing problem that I solve a problem most people don't realize they have. You know? <laughs> um, and actually, for that kind of people, I like to do a, a small getting things done demonstration because it's, it is one thing to talk about the approach and it's another one to actually show it. So some people like myself, we need to get explained some concepts with apples and oranges. So you always advocate that we should get everything out of our head and place it in a, tr a trusted system. So we're going to explore what's in this head. You know, I, I try to put things that are typically in our heads and let's go through, through what you can guide me through what I can do with the things in my head. Okay. There. Uh, be my guest. It looks, like, it looks like some heads I've seen. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> let's pull out the first object in our head. This might look like an old and dirty sock. It isn't. It's actually a great business idea. In my head, it woke me up at three o'clock in the morning and it's the Airbnb of clean socks. <laughs> so it's a brilliant idea. I still don't know what to do with it. So it's, it's keeping out at night. What do I do with my idea? This brilliant idea that was gonna make me rich and famous. Well, if that were me, I'd throw that sock into my end basket. Okay. And then <clears throat> in order to empty the end basket, I'd have to pick the sock up and say, okay, what is this? Hmm, it's an idea for a potential business. Then I'd have some specific, uh, specific algorithm of questions to ask myself. So, okay, is that an actionable item? Am I really interested in moving something? Am I committed to doing something about that right now? Yes or no? There are two optional answers, yes or no. So if I say, hmm, you know, it's a crazy idea, let me park it. Because there are a lot of non-actionable things, but you still need to keep track of them. First of all, there's trash called, ah, that was a dump. That was a three o'clock a.m. idea. I had too much wine when I had that idea. This is, this is irrelevant. Oh, God, you know, there's another one of those, David. You don't need that. So that's trash. 
That's one option. Another option is, you know, uh, I have a file. I have actually have a box of potential, potential business ideas that I just want to keep as reference. So in case I wind up with a gazillion dollars, I have a batch of things. So that's reference. So that, that, that would go in that box or that file or a note about that would go into that place. The third option, if there's no action is, you know, no action now, but you know, there might be at some point. So I then have a choice to, do I want to put this on a someday maybe list? Look, here's potential business ideas. I stick that on a list that I want to review weekly or monthly or ever. Or I say, you know, I may have some VC capital or I may, I'm, I'm inheriting a bunch of money, but it's not going to come through until five months from now. So six months from now, I want to see that. So I may then park that in a tickler file or put it on a calendar, get a trigger. If I say, ooh, no, wait, I do want to move on that. Then I go, okay, what would moving look like? What's the very next step that I need to take? Great. Now I can sleep better with that idea <laughs> moving forward. Yeah. Um, let's dig out something else. Um, golf ball. I always have this picture of myself um, when I'm retired playing golf, but I'm terrible at playing golf right now. And I know that I'm not going to magically turn you know, into a ma an amazing golf player when I retire. So I figured that I have to something, do something about it right now. So it's one of the other things that, one, another 3 a.m. idea yeah, cool. there in my head. Well, again, that would for me would go in my end basket and say, okay, golf, what do I want to do about that? So again, it's a critical factor is first of all, capturing the things that are potentially meaningful. You haven't decided the meaning yet, but it might be. And that's what you want to be able to get out, get out of your head and get out in front of you. And then you need to go through, well, let me define what exactly it means to me right now. If you haven't done this process, by the way, your mind is still going, but well, what are we going to do? But Aaron, what are we going to do? What, what are we going to do? What is it? What does it mean? What is it? We, and you got to shut the monkey up. So I figured out the algorithm about how you shut the monkey up. And you shut the monkey up by going actionable or not. Yes or no. And it sounded like you said, yeah, you know, now that is something I want to move on right now. I said, great. What would moving look like? If you had nothing else to do but improve your golf game right now, where would you go and what would you do physically? So the next physical action is a critical uh, a question to ask and answer about anything that you have some commitment to move on. Yeah, so the first thing that comes to my head is I have a colleague at work, Lori. He's an amazing golf player and my next action could be you know, call up Lori, propose him to go sure. play golf. So well, you need to decide, is that a call? Is that a text? Is that an email? Is that a walk up and talk to him? because you need to get that granular about it. If you don't, you'll still be bothered. Well, should I call him? Should I email him? Whatever. So you got to shut the monkey up by getting very, very specific and very granular about what would moving look like? Where would it happen? Okay. My colleague, Laurie, sits right in front of me, so I'll just walk up and, say, and talk about it. Yeah, but you still need to put some reminder to do that, or your mind keeps having that job. What you want to do is take the job of remembering and reminding off your psyche because it does not do that. It was not designed for that. It was not evolved to do that. It cannot handle that very well. That's what's so seductive is because when you're thinking about the golf ball and thinking about Lori, that's so self-evident. You're sure you won't forget it. And you don't realize when you walk out into the world, the fire hose of reality is going to hit you in the face. And that can become prehistoric back there, but still pulling on you. So what you need to do is externalize it. So as you know, as what I, a lot of what I teach is building the trusted external brain so the brain is relieved of what it does not do very well. So even something as simple as that, you probably either need to put the golf ball <laughs> on your desk so that that will be the reminder to be able to do that, or, you know, just some sort of a, a, a if, if Lori is somebody you talk to regularly, then you might have an agenda list for them to go over with that or just an at office action that when you're in your office, you see this list of things to do. Oh, let me walk over and talk to Laurie about that. Right, so just to summarize that, what well, you just mentioned, I mean, there's tons of things in my head keeping me awake at night. This is, you know, some notes I took at one of the meetings. So what you're proposing is, at least I first I put it in my in basket and then eventually I had to ask myself the question, what is the precise next step for this? And well, is it actionable or not? I would, I would change the word eventually to within 24 hours, get rid of it. What do you need to do to, get, to throw that piece of paper away? And what you need to do is decide the contents on there. What specifically are they? Is it trash? Is it reference? Is it something actionable? And make those decisions so that then you can take that placeholder 
and get rid of it and now have the real work you define to do in a real appropriate place that actually lets that guides you to actually do the work right well with that in mind <laughs> if you were to rewrite the getting things done book what would be a section a phrase a sentence that you would change remove something that you would say people just always misinterpret this or they took that footnote too seriously or what would it be i did just rewrite the book oh um and didn't change much of anything other than sort of bring the language more current um and really imp it, it, it's really the emphasis on the more subtle sort of the lifelong lifestyle um, aspect of what this art and craft is in terms of managing your life and work and being able to surf on top of it and still feel buried by it. So something like, you know, my, you know, our, our admonition right now, that your head is for having ideas and not for holding them. I don't think I wrote that in the first book, but that's now been validated by cognitive science in the last 20 years. Your head was not designed for that. It does not do that very well at all. I learned that on the street. You know, a lot of the cognitive scientists are now have performed experiments and all kinds of things to prove that you're trying to keep any four, more than four meaningful things in your head, you will absolutely lose perspective on it and denigrate your performance in anything you're trying to focus on. That's not, that's now scientific data. So a lot of what the what I would change <laughs> is simply to say, guys, this is a much bigger thing. This is not a nice to have. This is a this is a must have if you're trying to navigate in the world of so many options and so many possibilities and so much change and so many things you actually have to think about to decide what it means to you and then be able to then see the relationship between all those potentially meaningful things and make good choices. That's, that's not lightweight stuff. Okay, David, there is this talk right now um, about the increasing complexity of knowledge work the speed of change, the speed of life, constant inputs, always on, etc., etc. Is life really getting more complex and difficult, or are we just getting whinier and wimpier about it? Well, there's a yes and no answer to that. In a way, the, what's really changed is how ubiquitous and how frequent and the volume of potentially meaningful information that we're allowing into our lives. It's kind of the stress of opportunity of options, you know, they're showing up. You know, people get very clear and relaxed in a crisis because they absolutely forces them to focus on one thing, <laughs> right? The real crisis happens when you're not in a real crisis because then the, ain't, the barbarians at the gate come all flooding through. The barbarians of overwhelming opportunity you know, are allowed in and you've got a whole lot of, uh, you know, a whole lot of that is kind of in your face. You know, another issue is that all of that stuff and the, the brain scientists have validated now, you know, the, the pings in your email, you know, just handling that and, and looking at it and dealing with it and, and, and moving, doing something about it creates dopamine in your brain. It's a highly addictive process to deal with all of those little pings out there. You know that are that are happening and coming to you so what happens is that you know there's a part of you that get, truly gets addicted to the ping you know the problem is that that that, that denigrates your brain's ability to, to, to truly focus and think you know at, at, in its optimal state so that that all of that is, is different in, in another way it's no different it, it, I mean you gotta understand people talk about information overload that's not the problem if that was you'd walk into a library and blow up right <laughs> It, it's it's <laughs> the the most information rich place in the world is the most relaxing nature because it has more inputs, you know, and more different horizons than than almost any other place. If you want to go crazy, take out all the your information. It's called sensory deprivation. You go nuts, right? So the brain actually loves that. It needs that. It needs all that variety and so forth. The problem is, is in nature, there's not that many potentially meaningful things. There's snakes and bears and berries and thunderstorms, and that's about it. You know, maybe the lion eating, you know, the man eating tiger that somebody saw at the, at the, at the river, you know, this morning. Oh, uh, you know, that, the brain is kind of hand, can handle that pretty well, but the rest of it is no big deal. But, you know, you got 2,000 emails in your in basket. Every one of those could be a bear, a snake, a tiger, a thunderstorm, or whatever. And so it's the potential meaning in there that's still not been clear that will eat you alive. And about those 2,000 emails, I mean, what should people do? Is it okay to just declare like email bankruptcy, you know, select all, delete, and sure, if, if, you, if it was if important? You, sure, as long as you pray. 
<laughs> as long as you believe in some higher power that will forgive you for whatever you just dumped down the toilet. Okay, thank you for that. When I first read your book, I loved it, but there was a little part of me that hated you <laughs> because you put me in a very difficult position. Uh, suddenly I was alone amongst this team of GTD illiterates. So uh, GTD seems to be great for individuals, but what about teams? I mean, have you found any way of that teams and organizations can use the GTD principles? Well, there are a couple of lenses to, to put on that that, 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 that may, may offer some, some perspective. One is, can you teach an organization to read? No. Right. You can only teach individuals to read, but does, do organizations need literate people in order to be competitive? Yes. So you can't teach an organization GTD, but you need people who, who possess and, and process and manifest these behaviors and these methodologies in order to be maximally effective. On the other hand, another perspective on this is that the same principles that apply to an individual about how you get your kitchen or your country or your company under control and, and appropriately focused apply to a team. In other words, if I were to consult to your team, first thing I'm going to do is walk in and go, what has the team's attention right now? Right? Now somebody's going to need to answer that, but whatever, whatever that enterprise is will have its attention on things based upon whatever, why that team exists, what its purpose is, what, it, what its raison d'etre is, it will have some things that say, there's things that are not on cruise control. Those could be problems, opportunities, challenges that the team is dealing with. So we have to identify that. That's exactly how I would work with you personally. What's got your attention? So that same principle will apply and we'll, we will go through the same algorithm. Yeah. I would like to take your analogy of, you know, having literate teams, right? Um, just in the same way that you don't want individual team members to use their poetry skills while writing email, uh, you know, there are some best practices as a team, you know, some team conventions that you can reach uh, when communicating, whether it's email or phone and so on. Sure. Um, what could be two or three tips or conventions that teams could use for applying some GTD principles? Well, first of all, one of the biggest lacks we've seen with teams is the lack of a team weekly review. In other words, how often does a team need to get together and say, okay, as a team, what are the relevant projects that are going on right now that still need to go on right now? How do we intersect all of those? Which projects need to be moved off to someday, maybe your parking lot? Which new events have shown up now that are required for the team? So that kind of step back reflection of what's the content of the work of the team and how has that changed? It's one of the biggest needs out there right now. It's the biggest need for individuals to be able to do that for themselves personally. The difference, the, the one specific little difference about teams is teams usually don't have to have the rigor to get down to what's the very next action on something. They just need to allocate output. You know, gee, are, are you, are you going to handle that or me? You have to then decide what your next steps are to handle the deliverable that you've agreed with the team to come up with. Thank you. Um, David, very few people recognize themselves as project managers. However, under your definition of a project, which is any multi-step action or outcome, everybody is a project manager, right? Um, do you think that this little gap is, is one of the main reasons of, of people feeling out of control of their work? That is, should people be more structured about how they approach knowledge work, knowledge sure. work in general? Well, that's why my last book, Making It All Work, the subtitle was you know, winning at the game of work and the business of life. People need to lighten up a lot about their work, you know, ecosystem and they need to get a lot more business-like about, uh, excuse me, who's handling the Halloween party? Mom. Oh, I, uh, mom's a project manager when she's got to have the, she's got to get the costumes for the kids and they, you know, that, that's the project manager. Now we should probably just change the word project because, you know, I think a lot of people will be allergic to thinking they're project managers because they think project is like, you know, build a new car or launch the ad campaign or those kind of, which are projects for sure. But your next holiday is a project. Hiring assistance is a project. Getting a new babysitter is a project. Deciding which cell phone service you want. You know, figuring out how you're going to engage with your kids at what age and giving them cell phones. That's a project. So anything that you can't finish when you think of it that's going to take more than one step to get there, you better identify that, put that stake in the ground out there, otherwise it'll own you and run you ragged if you don't get control of it. So, you know, yes, we should probably change the vocabulary, but that's, 
we haven't found any better vocabulary to describe actually what it is. Um, why is the natural planning model that you propose in your book so unnatural or uncommon? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, it's how we get dressed. It's how we walk. It's how we talk. You know, we have some. You know, we, we're trying to accomplish something. I need to fulfill my hunger. You know, you have some vision. I'm, oh, I want Mexican food, margaritas. That'll be really cool. You then say, well, well, wait a minute. What time is it? And do I want to go by myself or whatever? Am I dressed okay? And you say, well, let me just call the restaurant and see if they're open. And you do that, and then you go out to dinner and have Mexican food. That process is the natural planning model. So I didn't make something up. I just identified what we normally do. I think the reason, <laughs> the reason that that's probably not the, the natural, the, that's not the normal way people do it is because we were trained that if, we, if we're actually trying to sit down and organize something, we need to organize it first. And we, and we don't actually walk through the, the processes we do just, just to normally get things done. Maybe our training says, okay, you need to now write a paper, or you need to do something. And so, we, okay, Roman number one, A, C, subset B, okay, and that's planning, and that's what people think about. And that's so unnatural, you know, to have people sit down and try to do that to begin with, that most people just freak out and don't do anything. So then the world falls on their head, and when it falls on their head, then they start to react. Oh my God, now, now, now what do we do? As opposed to, well, wait a minute, this has my attention. How do I figure out what I'm trying to do, what success would look like, what are the components of it, and how do I allocate my resources for it? So that, that was a long way to say, I still don't know why the natural model hasn't, isn't the normal model. Uh, David, maybe it's because I'm an engineer, but um, I strive on last minute work. Um, it, it seems that for me and for many people that I know, the, the only thing that sets things moving is a due date. Now, you don't mention much the due dates on your lists. You, you tend to say, you know, do the list so you can do them a, as soon as you can. You know, can you develop a few thoughts on that? Well, what a due date does is forces you to make decisions, right? So, and that's what we hate is making a wrong decision. So we'll avoid decision making as long as we possibly can and a due date will force you to have to decide, okay, come on, is it good enough? I know, I deal with this too. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a common syndrome out there that, that people have and you can start to learn to train yourself to go ahead and make decisions you know, before the crisis forces you to. You can create artificial deadlines. You know, so that's one way to do it. Because one of the things I discovered if I'm writing, if I'm doing some creative writing, I, for years, I, it used to just so frustrate me because what I do is I would wait to the deadline, like you, right? Because it would force me to have to decide, okay, it doesn't have to be perfect, just write. Okay, got it. And I would get it out there, and then I'd turn it in, and then the next day or two days later, I'd go, oh, God, I should have said. So at that, then I started to realize I need to set false deadlines for myself so that it forces me to push the thing there and then still gives me two days to catch all the, oh, God, I should have said. So <coughs> that's a, it is a discipline. That, 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 that's a habit to try to train yourself to learn to think that way about the decision-making. But that's, that's, why, that's why people wait. That's why people love deadlines. It's simply because it forces them to decide. So <laughs> thank you for that tip. Uh, false deadlines, that's a new one for me. <laughs> um, so as you know, and your experience on consulting for more than 30 years will show, um, getting people to change is hard. So how do you manage to change behavior in people beyond simply prescri prescribing the GTD formula? You know, we're still working on that. What are the best ways to do that? I think the best way to do it is to really get people to to start to get uncomfortable with where they are. Most people are just too comfortable with where they are to, to, to do the kind of changes that are, that are potentially required. And when I say comfortable, a lot of people, their comfort zone is being uncomfortable. So it's the strange paradox that you, you, you can get addicted to whatever you're used to. So you know, how long can you be happy without having a guilt feeling before some part of you starts to feel guilty about not having any guilt feelings and so you better think about what you ought to be feeling guilty about. It's a very, very subtle you know, little game that people play internally. And if you're used to a kind of stress and a kind of pressure, having nothing on your mind and being really relaxed so that you're fully present is a very unusual and unfamiliar place. And anything unusual and unfamiliar to your nervous system will feel uncomfortable, even if it's cool. You know, having a lot of money, you know, people inherit a lot of money or they win the lottery and they, you know, it's gone in three months. Why? Because 
I, I, I'm not used to this, and so they'll go find ways to get rid of it. So, you know, I think the main challenge, if you're really talking about what's, what's going to change real behavior in terms of that, is getting used to a new standard, raising the bar about how clear you want to be and, and feel. So a lot of our job is to get people to just taste this and experience it. Because most people haven't ever experienced what it's like to have all that stuff going on in their life and have nothing on their mind. And be present with their daughter's soccer game. Or with the birthday party. Or with, the, or with their nap. Or with whatever they're doing. And so getting people to taste that, get used to it, is, the, is, is I think the big game. I mean, a lot of people who've taken to my stuff are people who were just in so much pain, they were thrown out of their comfort zone with that transition in their life that happened, that, that, that they got fired, they got promoted, they, they got married, they got divorced, they got kids, the kids went away. Those are the transition times when people are often most attracted to this because it blows, it takes them out of their comfort zone. Now they're feeling really out of control, help. I need to get back to some level of control that I was familiar with before. So a lot of the people who the uptake on GTD has been, you know, from the people who were, who've been probably in the most pain of their overwhelm or in major transitions in their life that kind of blew it out. Uh, but the, the, in the ultimate game, I think for people to buy into the fact that, that there is a place available, there is light at the end of the, there is a there is a place to get to that will allow you to navigate this game in a sustainable way and not turn to toast. I understand that your wife is fully into GTD. How did you manage to do that? <laughs> I mean, think about the early days, weeks, months. She was there before we got together. That, that, that helped. I mean, she's been doing this since she was in her 20s. You know, she took a seminar of mine. We, were, and we both had very different lives at that point. So she's been involved with this for, for years. And at some point, we got together. But, you know, but there, there, there's so many other things to deal with than, than any of that. I mean, that's just a, that's just a given. So there's no hope for those of us who have married into a, I mean, my wife is amazing, but there's no way I can, I can get her into GT. No, there's no hope. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> At least I got that off my head. Well, come on, you're the last person in the world she'd believe, you know. So. And the truth is that what GTD does would just validate a lot of what she probably already does. You know, the funny thing is, we, you know, people come back and go, wow, I just did this GTD thing and it's so fabulous. And they say, I've been telling you this for 32 years. <laughs> <laughs> and, the, and they actually probably have in their own way. I, I just probably framed it a way people could buy into it better. Right. Um, David, GTD was published in 2001, if I understand correctly, mm -hmm. which is in IT and communication terms, the Middle Ages. Um, <laughs> what technology-driven bad habits are getting us into more trouble now? And how has technology helped us get of those bad habits? Or how can technology help us get more structure into work? Mm, that's a big question. Uh, the simple answer is the, the, the downside is the plethora of options and opportunities that it gives you. And if, you're, if you don't have a really cool, clean, intact system, you'll just be overwhelmed by, should I put this in Evernote? Do I want to stay this in Dropbox? What, well, how do I connect that over here? Let me stick it over here. Let me Siri that to myself on a list in here, over here. And so they've given you so many way, wicked, cool, seductive things to actually go play in that it's spread your, it can very easily spread your life and potentially meaningful things in too many places to be able to actually manage really well. For the most part, technology hasn't changed a whole bunch. It's just sped it up, made it easier to find stuff and, and, and get it faster, but it hasn't really changed the game like word processing did or spreadsheets did. Nothing has really happened since then that was really game changing. The web cer certainly and the cloud you know, ha has just made it more, more obvious and a big ubiquitous and easily accessible. But quite frankly, uh, you know, the funny thing about it is once you catch this methodology, and GTD was the first non-tech meme that virally went through the tech world. Because what it did was it validated whatever people had as technology. They were able to then find a way to, to, to then use that technology in a much more productive way, applying the methodology. Once you get GTD, technology doesn't matter. You know, I, I write it on my arm. I write it on paper. I don't care. Give me, give me any kind of list manager and I'll make it work. Frankly, nothing's as good as the Palm Pilot in terms of the list manager. It was the best there was. It was the easy, it was the most ubiquitous, most cool, felt the classiest. The form factor was fabulous. And there are a lot of cool, cool things out there. You can make any of them. Or you can make Outlook work, OmniFocus things. You know, all, the, all those things really work really well if you work them. If you understand the methodology, you can make all that work. The kind of paradox is, is once you really understand the methodology, you, you do really want the coolest tool for yourself. Right. 
David, for closing this interview, there is one question that we ask every single guest in our interviews. It's a difficult one, and, but I'm sure that you will set up the standard for everybody else because you're, you're the first one. And the question is, what is your big why? The big why is to produce conditions for people to flourish. Thank you for your answer. And thank you for your time for this interview. And thank you for the book and for sharing all of your ideas with us. And see you next time. Thank you. My pleasure.